Okay, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are around the world. My name is Julian Stuhler. Uh, I'm one of the directors of Trident Consulting, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third of our series of four DB2 LUW podcasts. Uh, today, we're going to be talking specifically about uh, pure scale enhancements in uh, DB211 for uh, LUW. And we've got our usual uh, two speakers here, where we've got uh, IBM's George Backlars and Triton's own uh, Iqbal Gorawala. And they're going to uh, spend the next hour uh, entertaining us and uh, informing us all about PureScale. So, George, over to you. Uh, thanks, Julian. And uh, welcome, everyone. And thanks to those of you who have uh, listened through our first two. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, the PureScale enhancements that came in uh, DB2 version 11. So, before I start, uh, Iqbal, any uh, comments or stuff that came up from last week or stuff that we should be um, kind of extending our talks about on? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, George, and thanks again for joining us. Thank you, everybody, uh, wherever you are in the world, for joining. Uh, this is our third uh, webinar, and uh, yeah, I mean, really exciting uh, to be talking about all the different uh, uh, goodies that we have in version 11. Uh, last week, George, we, talk, we touched on uh, uh, where we, we talked about blue enhancements in DB2 version 11, and, and I just uh, just want to quickly, like I did last time, to you know, you know, just summarize. Uh, what I took away from uh, last week's webinar. Um, of course, the big news in terms of Blue for this release was uh, Blue on MPP. Uh, okay, uh, you know, and that's that's really fascinating. Uh, we all know how powerful Blue is on a single node. So uh, enhancing that to multiple partitions, multiple nodes, just you know makes it uh, you know makes makes the scalability, makes the performance uh, ever so great. Um, one thing I, I, I took away was uh, this is this is you know what I just said is true because the data exchange during the distributed joins and the aggregation processing occurs entirely within the blue runtime uh, engine in, 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 in and it occurs in native columnar format. So that's I think a, a really fantastic enhancement. It's really in the engine. It's not an add-on or bolt-on. Again, just like how it's been done, how how blue was implemented on a single node. It's similar. To what's been done on MPP, so that's I think really good stuff. Uh, I, and, and I think we also had a George, if you remember, we had a good discussion uh, on, on whether you know, uh, you know, whether people want to you know, with, with, with current DPF environments or MPP environments, uh, want to coalesce those and, and move into single node blue, or, or they want to stay on um, MPP, and, uh, and and you know, and, and then you know, uh, sort of you know, convert the tables to to blue and, and you know you know uh, you remember we had some good discussions on that George uh, and if you could just sort of remind people you know the sure you know yeah kind of kind of why one or the other right yeah and yeah, uh, yeah. yeah I think I think the bottom line with blue was that if you already have an MPP system or DPF putting blue on there is probably easier because all your scripting and stuff would have to change if you collapsed everything into a single image. But uh, the other option, though, is when you do go to a single image, you're going to simplify your life a little bit. You'll give back more memory and storage because you're only going to be running one instance, especially in a in a virtualized environment, right, with LPARs. So it's uh, really have to sit down and say, you know, can I can I simplify my life by going to a single image? And again, that means that one box is going to have to run all of your queries, you know, or do I want to keep my my current setup with all of my um, you know nodes already, all my scripting's already done for a DPF environment? So. Again, it's it's not a simple yes or no. You kind of have to look at your entire environment and decide which is which is the best way to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And uh, so, so, so yeah. I mean, uh, so, so uh, yeah. That, that's something obviously we, you have to do with any any new sort of feature, and especially if you want to implement Blue, uh, it's something which you need to look at. You need to look at your application and how much embedded MPP stuff you have in your application. Uh, you right. know, whether it necessitates rewrite or, or not. Uh, that that just might be straight away an answer for you. Um, we also talked about performance improvements, uh, uh, you know, in, in blue, uh, DB211, whether on MPP or on a single node, right? We do, you know, you you, may, you you went through SQL merge, you, you you know, you talked about nested loop joins, uh, and, 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 and and the algorithm that's been changed to 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 to, to give performance enhancements. Um, you also talked about OLAP uh, OLAP functions and the sort. Uh, these are being pushed down into the blue engine. Okay, which means that it you know the you know the much 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 more performant now, and and I think you, you know you also talked about the correlation of correlated subqueries, right? Uh, yeah. Where you know uh, that 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 you know it's all you know it's, it's, the 
way it was always done, uh, you know, using the join and everything. You know, it's, it's, it's different now. Uh, different algorithm is being used, and that uh, you know has shown showed us some results as well. Uh, has shown quite a number, of, quite quite a bit of performance enhancements, right? So, yeah. so these are these are the kind of takeaways I took uh, from from last. Uh, anything anything you want to add uh, just to summarize last week's uh, webinar? Well, I think I, I think it's a it's a big change for Blue, and I think a lot of the stuff we pushed down into the engine is going to make a significant difference for anybody who's running Blue today. And again, I would recommend that you know people get uh, yourself involved or someone from the Triton team if they're looking at implementing Blue on on DPF or collapsing it because it's like I said, it, it isn't an easy decision which way to go, but uh, you know, you'd probably, you'd probably be there to give them a hand in terms of deciding what's the best approach. Yeah, happy to right. do that. Okay, before we start, just obviously my last question for you is where in the world is George today? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a where's Wally or Waldo or whatever, you know. Um, uh, no, I'm actually in my home office, which is in a little place called Rockwood. It's a town of about 3,000 people, about 60 miles west of Toronto. So uh, yes, I am not in the air today. Uh, tomorrow, however, I'll be in sunny Hartford, uh, which is really nowhere. But <laughs> at least, at least I'm home. Today. Yeah. Now next week, uh, surprisingly, I will be back in the UK. So we're going to do our final session next week, which will be on the SQL enhancements. And I don't want anybody to miss that, because uh, you know, as uh, when it comes to SQL, IBM is one of the leading vendors for introducing SQL that nobody knows how to use. So attending our session next week, you're going to find out what you can do with all this new SQL. Okay. Fantastic. All right, so with that, let's get uh, started on PureScale sure. and uh, kind of what we've done new there. So let me just get past our uh, legal statement there. By the way, uh, June 15th, that's going to be tomorrow, and that's going to be our electronic GEGA date for uh, DB2. So I'm uh, keeping my fingers crossed. Everything will yeah. uh, is that all we'll on, Is that all on schedule and everything is? Well, so far, you know. Okay. okay. It was easy. Okay. It was either that or June thirty second, but um, I'm, I'm, hope, I'm hoping tomorrow. You know, everything is good. So here's what we're going to go through with this session today. We're going to talk about pure scale architecture for those who don't already know what it's made up of. Uh, look at the changes to the OS, the new systems that Pure Scale supports, some virtualization changes. Uh, we're going to kind of review the installation licensing again, so people know that Pure Scale now can be used in all of the editions of DB2, but there are some restrictions. Um, some uh, high availability uh, disaster recovery enhancements, or HADR. Um, we're also going to talk about what we call uh, geographically dispersed uh, pure scale. Uh, those are for very, very high availability requirements. So that's something that uh, some customers may want to use, but um, it has a couple drawbacks. One is distance, and one is it's a lot more expensive. Okay. Um, and then we'll look at some of the performance enhancements in pure scale, uh, some new work work. Uh, load balancing options and some manageability changes. So with that, let's just quickly look at uh, what PureScale is. So PureScale is uh, similar and it's actually based on the same design and code as what we do on the mainframe. So on the mainframe we refer to as a Sysplex and coupling facility and what we've done is implemented that in software. Okay, And we use actually some specific hardware components to do what we call in-memory hardware assisted locking. Okay, so it's not that in, it is it is software we've written, but we're using hardware extensions in order to do this. So basically, PureScale has a number of key components. The first one is members, and members are just like a DB2 instance running on a server, and you can have many members in a cluster, and you can actually have up to 128 members. I don't think anybody's been crazy enough to do that, but typically we will see a minimum of two members, and probably the largest cluster I'm aware of personally is about eight. Okay, and then those clusters are connected with an interconnect, and there's three types of interconnect. They can be like um, regular IP, so you know Ethernet, or they could use high-speed RDMA. Okay, so this is um, this is direct memory access through Ethernet. Okay, or you can use InfiniBand. So it's either 10 gig interconnect using something called RDMA or InfiniBand. And then we have um, what we call coupling facilities, and these are kind of the, the lock managers that manage all the locks between the members. There's two of them, a primary and a secondary, and then we have this shared database that is connected to all of these members. So this is a shared database system. I mean, every member looked at the same data. So that's why you kind of need centralized locking, and we use these coupling facilities to do that. Okay, and on top of the coupling facilities, we also have some services that are running to make sure that what's called 
uh, really clustering services or coupling services that are checking to make sure that all these components are running. So we detect things like uh, failures George, in the talking manager, George, right? Uh, George, yeah. Let me just uh, hold you off a little bit here. I think uh, I think people cannot see your slides. I cannot see them as oh, well. So uh, right. it, it said it was running. Ah, you know when they started the uh, the recording, it stopped the uh, screen showing. Okay, so maybe Jules uh, can give it to you again. The screen there, it, should be, it should be showing it according yeah, it's to what now. Yeah, it's, it's working now. So if you if you can just maybe 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 quickly backtrack a little bit. Uh, sure. Just okay. Just, yeah. Good idea. Okay. okay let's thank just you. previous. Previous. Yeah, thank, yeah, just let's go to the agenda again. And okay, so, so everybody, if you didn't hear us, it was a really funny conversation between so myself and, and Iqbal. We talked about last week, blue, blah. Okay, now we've got the uh, <laughs> the legal stuff, and there's the agenda. So now we got, okay, now we got the pure scale architecture back. Okay, so you heard all that stuff I talked about. So there's the picture now that kind of describes what I was saying. Um, so first of all, multiple DB2 members, right, available for your scaling. We've got the uh, connection can be to any one of these members. We have a shared database on logs, so all the members see the same database. We have the locking managers, which do all the locking and actually act as global buffer pools for certain hot pages. And the interconnect can be hardware-based, so either 10 gig with RDMA, which is, which is remote data memory access, okay, or InfiniBand, or just standard IP. Okay, so you've got lots of options how you connect these things together. The main takeaway from all of this is that PureScale allows for, you know, failure of any of the members or locking or even the database, uh, the disks, and continues to run without interruption to the actual workloads. Okay, so it's a very high availability environment. Okay, and so PureScale has been around since 2009, so it's, it has been out for a while now. The first release came in something called nine, version 9.8. So some of you may be running on 9.7. 9.8 was a point release that introduced PureScale. Um, so we've had it out for, um, I guess we're coming into our seventh year now. So it's, uh, you know, it's beginning to grow in terms of usage because customers are starting to realize the value of having a continuously available system. So George, uh, just, just a couple of questions before you move on. Um, yep. what, what, what additional requirements does PureScale have beyond needing just another member? For either scaling or failover. Well, actually, it, it depends on how what kind of level of performance you're looking at because because pure scale by itself doesn't need any special interconnect. We can just use regular Ethernet IP, right? Yeah. The, it needs, however, these coupling facilities, and and coupling facilities is basically um, it could be a separate machine. Doesn't have to be. Usually, what we see in smaller clusters is it uses one core on the uh, the the machine that you're running on. So, for instance, let's say you have an eight-core or eight, let's say uh, you know a, a four-core system. One of the cores would be dedicated to the locking. Okay, so you don't have to actually have a separate machine, uh, but that core is dedicated to just handling all the locking requirements for the cluster. So you'd have two of them. One would be in one machine, one be in another, because obviously you want to isolate them so that they're in separate machines in case one of the machine goes down. Um, but uh, there's no licensing requirement, so you don't have to pay for this, the cycles that that coupling facility uses. So We're only for the DB2, right? Is that, is, that, is that true? Even if the CFs, you're talking about the CFs now, uh, are on different boxes? Yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they're different boxes. Uh, if they're on the same box, there's no licensing charge for it, right? So you don't include them as part of your DB2 license cost. OK. OK. And okay. You know, is, it, uh, is it sort of uh, advisable to have them on, you know, uh, on their own separate, you know, small like sort of resourced boxes, uh, boxes, you know, a couple of cores each or whatever it is, is that preferable? Um, no, it's not necessary. Again, it depends on the size of your cluster, right? Yeah. Uh, because, you can, you know, the, the core is dedicated to just sitting there and doing the uh, locking traffic. So if it's sitting there by itself in the same machine as your DB2 instance, they're not interfering with one another, okay? So it just depends on what resources you have available. If you put it on a separate machine, obviously you need to connect to the, you know, interconnect. So there's going to be some more latency. If it's sitting inside the machine, there's not going to be as much latency with the local DB2, right? Right. Okay. So, okay. But it will require some resources on the machine yeah. if it's a DB2, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's take a look at what does PureScale run on, and um, 
So there's a new operating system that we support uh, in this release for PureScale. It's Power Linux Little Indian. So if anybody is running Power Linux LE, they'll be able to run uh, PureScale on it now. Uh, we support uh, Red Hat currently. You'll notice that um, it's only Red Hat right now, Power Linux. We expect in a future release to also support or, or maybe a fix pack to support SUSE as well. Um, on Intel, we can run uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux or SUSE, so you know that's available on your Intel, Intel systems. On AIX, we can run natively on 7.1. And then there's also a number of virtualized environments. So you can run on Power VM, Power KVM on Power uh, environments and Red Hat KVM on Linux, okay, as well as VMware ESXi. So you've got a couple options where you run, uh, you know, uh, pure scale. And what about, uh, what about, uh, we, we touched on, uh, uh, you know, Z, Z, Z Linux la, la last week. Uh, is pure scale supported for that? Uh, no, pure scale is not supported on, on Z Linux. Um, okay. You know, now mind you, we've had requests for that, but then we also point out the fact that if you're running DB2 on on uh, Z natively, you already have the coupling facility there. So it's you know, you basically what you're doing is you're moving something that you already have into a virtualized environment. So I don't know if the requirement is as as big for having it on on Z Linux. However, Blue does run on Z Linux. Yeah, yeah, we covered it last week. That's good. Now licensing has changed in this release. We, we talked about that in our first session. And um, so just so you know that PureScale is available uh, for any size cluster on the advanced edition. So that means if you want to scale out you know, to like four or six or eight members, yeah. that is included in the advanced edition licenses. So that's for workgroup advanced and enterprise. So DB2 advanced edition, DB2 workgroup advanced edition. Both include PureScale for any size cluster. Okay. That's amazing. I mean, so you know, you're saying that basically, you know, you know, if I if I if I, if I have a 16 node cluster, it's the, you know, it's it's all included in the DB2 advanced uh, license. Yes. So that what now you, when I say it's included, that means you got to pay obviously for every one of those members, right? Yes, so yeah, that's, that's the difficult licensing. I wanted you to say that yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, the more the merrier for us, right? You obviously got to pay more. Um, However, all of the additions um, include it, now include uh, PureScale for what we call the administration high availability uh, single node option. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna discuss that in another slide. Um, the other thing people need to be aware of is I don't know if many people bought the business value continuity offering. That was kind of PureScale for this you know, uh, failover mode. And yes. uh, that, that's been discontinued as of the end of September. So anybody who has that, we would just we would just exchange your license to the next to the AWSE or AESE. Okay. But this uh, new low cost active passive licensing is now included in all of the DB2 editions. So that means so, work group enterprise whatever. Yeah. So this uh, this business continuity uh, offering was, wasn't that the two node cluster thing or was it for any pure scale sort of uh, Topology. Uh, yeah, that was that was for the workgroup edition, enterprise edition, right? So people would purchase that because you already had PureScale available in, in regular advanced editions. Right. So it's just a special offering, and um, basically you, you pay just like if you did an HADR cluster, right? Where you only pay a minimal amount for the second server. Right. Okay. Okay. So here's kind of what it looks like from a, from a usage perspective. So you would have a primary member. So let's say you're an existing customer as DB2 running today on a single member, okay, or a single instance of DB2. So in the new system, what you would do is that would be your primary member. And then you would create another member, and normally it would be of the same size, right? So you know, if you had a you know, four-core uh, system, you'd probably have a four-core backup, right? And so that secondary member now, you would have to pay for the minimal charge for that would be like 100 PVUs. Now what that allows me to do is on your primary member, all your workloads would go there. Okay, so there's a setting within uh, PureScale that says a set affinity, which basically says all your workloads goes to that one member. And so there'd be nothing going over to that second member from a production perspective. However, that second member now can be used for things like backups and statistics, reorging, monitoring, any kind of loading, right? You know, any kind of uh, DDL that you're doing, configuration yeah. 
changes, whatever. It could be done on a second member. Okay. okay so, so how yeah, much so how much how much do you pay for the second member, George? Um, it's 100, 100 PVUs. It's exactly like uh, HADR. Okay. Um, so that would be kind of our minimum charge on that second member. Uh, but you see, you could do actual real workloads over there. I mean, things like a backup normally would have taken some cycles out of the primary system, whereas now you're doing it on the secondary. So you know, even though we're using all of the cores that are on that secondary machine, we're not incurring the, the fully uh, full use charge, right, of that particular machine. So it's going to save you some money. So, so, so George, I mean, a, a thought here. I mean, you know, HADR, as we know, has you know similar like so. This is similar, as you mentioned, to HADR licensing for a standby node. Um, however, we know that HADR allows read on standby, right? Yeah. Uh, for, for for querying. So, wouldn't this be better? HDR or read by standby better deal for a customer who wants to use that second server just for reporting rather than use the pure scale two node cluster? Yeah, that actually brings up a good uh, point because um, HADR does allow the second server to be used for read only workloads. So, there's a couple of restrictions just so people know if you're going to do a workload on a secondary HADR, um, it, it can only do dirty reads, okay? So, it's, it's basically only reading, you know, data that's in, could be data that's in flight. You can't create any objects on that second server. So, like, it's basically, yeah, read only. And if anything happens from a DDL perspective where you're actually changing, let's say, an index or something on the primary HADR member, it's going to force all the workloads off the secondary when it does that work. So, there's, there's, there are some restrictions on what when that read only does on the second site. But the thing that people everybody, everybody needs to be aware of is that we only license HADR on the secondary for failover. So as soon as you introduce read-only on the standby, you are now going to have to license the remaining cores to do that work. So if you had a four-core server over there and you decided to use it for read-only, you're going to have to license it for four cores of work. So you're not saving any money anymore. You've actually started using the entire machine. Yeah. Right. No. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. You, um, you know, that definitely makes sense, really. Uh, again, you know, you just have to, you know, look at what you what your needs are. Uh, in terms of the, the you know, the, the slide we are looking at, uh, what if I want to use the second member for actual workloads? Is it going to be full licensing, just like you know, HDR? Yeah, or it's exactly the same as HDR. So if you said I want to use that second member for for everything, then yes, I have to pay for that second member. Okay. Okay, but I I I I, I still think this, you know, this this is a fantastic deal, really, because you know, if you can do all your utilities, if you can do all your backups and your admin stuff. You know, uh, in in an in active active cluster on one of the nodes, while your you, you know your your primary node is concentrating on purely on your workload, that's and, and, you know that's great. And 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 the, and the secondary node, the one which is you know doing all the admin work, is is ready for failover as well, right? Can take yes. all failover it's hot, right? Instant is hot, yeah. So yeah. it's know. hot. But what would happen if anything failed on the primary? All the workloads will instantly move to the secondary, right? right? And uh, you know the recovery is ex is extremely quick because those locking managers down there have all the information about what pages are being looked at, what locks are in place. So it's a very quick recovery. And um, and just so people know, is that when you do a workload against PureScale or even DB2 now, when the client detects a failure, it depends on where the SQL was. But if you had a transaction that was just simply an insert, an update, or a delete, or even a select, okay, and it failed during the uh, processing of that statement it will redrive the transaction for you at the recovery site. So that means there's no, in, there's no involvement by the application. It's just DB2 will automatically reconnect you to the second server or secondary server and then redrive the transaction. The only yeah. time it won't redrive the transaction if it was a very complex set of SQL. So if you've already done an insert and then you started an update, so you've actually got a transaction with a number of statements, it will have to redrive the transaction. But it, but the thing is, you, it re, will do the connection for you, and your application will see that a statement failure, and will have to restart. But for simple transactions, we do it for you. Yeah, no, that's good. I mean, okay. Um, just had a had a quick question before you move off this slide. I'm not sure if it, when you're going to move on, so I might as well ask it now. Um, okay, go ahead. This uh, uh, what the the TCP/IP interconnect, right? It's it's yeah. you know this, this particular Setup is, you know, supports that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. That's so I mean, that's socket to socket. That's what we call that, right? Yeah. So socket to socket TCP/IP. So so basically, you know, and then this is this is obviously uh, 
allowed for uh, just your standard WSE and your standard ESE, uh, right? Yes. Well, and so you know, this this is this is this is quite major, I think, in DB two eleven because I think it's you know really there's no excuse, for, especially for people who want you know who are really concerned about availability as 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 the driver as the SLA in the business, you know this this should be you know very easy to uptake and 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 really implement you know at at at, at, at a very good very low cost rate really. Yeah, and if if anybody's looking at this from a HA perspective, this is giving you local continuous availability. Right? Yeah. So this is a local statement. So you're going to have these machines within your data center somewhere. If you want disaster recovery, then you know HADR is probably a better alternative because it, it can go hundreds of miles away, whereas yeah. this cluster is restricted to being primarily local. Right? Yeah. So you can have the, uh, the, the pure scale cluster locally and, and, and connect it with you know, using HADR, which yeah. you know, pure, HADR works with pure scale, uh, you know, to, a, to, a, to a cluster somewhere. Uh, you know, remotely, right? Right. Yeah. So this, you can you can duplicate this cluster, so you can have this locally for anything that happens, a local failure. So that's typically like, you know, maybe the network goes down on one side, or one of these machines goes down, or and then you can have an HADR exact duplicate of this somewhere remote in in the event the actual data center goes down, where you have let's say an entire power failure or flooding or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So lots of options for people now for both continuous availability lots and yeah, lots of options really depending on what what people require. But 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 this is this is really I think this is I think personally you know IBM has really made it uh, you know uh, quite easy for people to you know uptake on pure scale now really. Yeah yeah that's the whole idea. We'd like to see more uh, um, usage of this. Cool. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at the whole upgrade process. So I don't know how many of your listeners actually have PureScale in, in, installed. Are you aware of any in your account uh, set? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are people who are using, you know, who, who are in the process. Well, who are using PureScale, pure but you know, stopped short because you know there was some complexity, as we know. This was right. before PIP was introduced, and, and 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 because you know they had to work with that existing network and hardware and everything. So they short. Unfortunately, they didn't go all the way. But now you know it's picking up again because. Quite, I, I would say, a number of our customers. Uh, the, the primary goal is high availability, right? Uh, same performance, uh, keep the same performance, but you know, give me the 100% uh, hot hot, you know, 99.9% availability. So, right. so we think quite a bit of people, you know, really excited about pure scale now that it's easier to sort of, you know, update it. You don't need any special, you know, connectivity, especially if it's, you know, my goal is availability. Right, and that's another reason why people may want to reach out to you for you know assessment of their availability requirements. Because when we look at availability, you know, people talk about you know five nines or you know can I need to be up ninety five percent of the time? What does that translate to in terms of downtime? And so a pure scale solution says I need the highest possible availability, you know, well into the nine 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 kind of thing, right? But for some people, they may say, "I don't need that kind of availability." You know, HADR being maybe enough because it's going to it's going to recover in a minute or whatever. You know, and that's that's fine. And there's some people who say, "I cannot afford any kind of outage," and that's where you know, pure scale becomes uh, you know the better solution, right? Absolutely. So, so anyway, um, a couple of things people need to be aware of. If you already have pure scale, the upgrade or migration is a little bit different than regular DB2. And regular DB2, we, we said that you can migrate directly from 9.7 right to, to version 11. In this release, for PureScale, PureScale started at 9.8, which was, a, was actually a different code base than DB2.9.7. So unfortunately, we can't do a direct upgrade from 9.8 to 11.1. .1. So for those customers who still have the early version of, of PureScale, they're going to have to go to 10.1 or 10.5 before they upgrade to version 11. Okay. 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 All right. Now, yeah. if they don't have... If they do happen to be on 10.1, they can go directly to 11.1. Or if they're in 10.5, they can go to 11.1. And the other good thing, too, is that if you are in fixed pack 7 of 10.5, you can do an upgrade without having to do an offline backup. So that's uh, the same as regular base DB2. Um, in fact, I'm going to show you some okay. graphics to kind of show you the whole upgrade process. Okay, and if okay. anybody's using HADR on pure scale, you still have to resync the reinitialize the secondary. That's not yet available. You know, in, in base DB2, you can do a HADR upgrade just by rolling forward, right? There's no need to do a, a reinitialize. Yeah, but in, but in pure scale, you're, yeah, you're going to have to. 
A um, couple things you should be aware of. There are some new migration log records sitting in uh, DB2. So when uh, these are used for the whole migration process. So just so you're aware that there are, we actually do place things into the log saying that you've now done an update. So if we roll forward through the logs, we know that it took place. We'll stop the actual uh, roll forward, tell you to upgrade the instance, and then uh, apply the version 11 log. So just something if you're doing a, a roll forward by using a uh, online backup. So let me kind of show you what happens from a migration perspective. So if you do happen to have pure scale today, or even base DB2, the, the process is exactly the same. So what would happen is, let's say you have 10.5 running fixed pack 7, and you know, you're doing some transactions, and I'm not sure if people will see the animation here. You can see why I'm a PowerPoint expert, right? So <laughs> we have a bunch, we have a bunch of logs. I can see those dollars there. That's why my title is CPO, right? Chief PowerPoint Officer for, for the DB2. <laughs> uh, so what you do is you do an online backup, right? And uh, so once your online backup completes, so that you know, so you don't have to shut down your system or anything. Um, at one point in time, you're going to have to do the upgrade. So that we will have to shut down your your DB2 system. You do the upgrade, and now it becomes 11.1. Um, at that point in time, you start running your transactions and you start your online backup again. Okay. So let's say at some point in time you haven't completed the online backup and you get a failure. So we now allow you to recover from that. So what basically what happens is you reinstall 10.5, 10, 10, 10 you restore the online backup, right? You apply the logs, obviously, up till end of logs. And as it's running, it'll say, aha, you did a upgrade. So it'll actually stop and tell you, now do your install of 11.1 again. And then it'll roll forward through your 11.1 logs to the point of the failure. And you could say, like, at that point in time, OK, we restart 11.1, and then you can, you know, continue running your transactions or start your online up, you know, online backup again. Okay, so that's the nice thing is that I don't necessarily have to do a full offline backup, which takes a long time. Okay, I can now just use my online backups in order to upgrade to version 11. But you have to be at 10.5, fix pack 7. Okay, so here's just a chart that explains exactly what I just did. So, um, you know, you won't see the animation in the slides, right? But, but here's kind of the description of what we just went through. Now, from an installment, installing and deployment point of view, there's been a number of things we've done. So Iqbal kind of pointed out that people found the complexity of PureScale to be quite high. And that's true because, you know, you're dealing with, um, you know, hardware microcode levels and the types of adapters that you're using, et cetera. If you're using, you know, the socket-based installation of PureScale, um, then it actually is very simple. There's very few steps that are required to get it up and running. Probably the biggest change between base DB2 and a PureScale is that we have to use a parallel file system. That's called GPFS. Okay, so, you know, GPFS has to be used in a PureScale cluster only because we have to have a file system that can be shared among all of these different instances. So that's the big difference between base DB2 and PureScale. Okay, and it used to be quite a few steps required, especially if you wanted to do, um, you know, like replicated GPFS, you know, for, for a number of reasons. It, it used a lot of commands, and in some cases like 30, 40 commands to do some of the clustering stuff. And that's all been redone. We've simplified the whole, you know, pre-checking, the network adapter checking, all that sort of stuff has been really cleaned up in this release. So people will find it a lot easier to get up and running. So just to give you a comparison, you know, to get PureScale up and running probably takes less than three hours, okay, for the whole cluster to be up and running. You compare that to some of the other technology that's out in the industry, and it could, sometimes it takes months to get the stuff running. So this really is a huge uh, change in kind of complexity in, in installation. So here's some of the things that are new in this release. For First thing we do is there's a new uh, uh, checking command, basically. It's db2 prereq check, and it will go out and check your adapters. Now, coming back to the whole PureScale Right environment. Remember, I said there are different ways of connecting these devices or members. The simplest one is just sockets, and we're going to have a slide in a minute that kind of compares performance of sockets to hardware-based locking. When we do hardware-based locking, we're going to use something called InfiniBand adapters or uh, 10 gigi RDMA adapters. Okay, and those require different types of switches, different types of cabling. You know, so they're obviously more sophisticated, and there's more costs involved. Because yeah. when we do these types of um, hardware-based locking, we're actually doing memory-to-memory -memory communication. So they're extremely quick, 
It's all hardware-based messaging. So we're not going through the normal IP stack and software stack of sending messages. We're doing it in hardware. Okay, and that's why it's more expensive because you're using very specialized adapters. But the, the reason for using these adapters is all about performance. And the performance becomes an issue when you start getting into a large number of members. So like, you know, something like three, four, getting above four members, you may want to start looking at hardware adapters. But for things like dual systems, where I've got one as a primary and one as a secondary, then using just socket-based communication is sufficient you know, for the performance that you need. You, know, you don't have to go to these specialized hardware pieces. And that's what drives up the cost and the complexity of PureScale, is using, is using hardware adapters. So, but the good news is, is that we've really simplified the checking of the devices, make sure they got the right microcode level, they got the right hardware, the right cabling. That's all done through these prerequisite checking. So that's one thing that's really made it easier for people to use PureScale. And there's also something called a health check, which will actually go through after you've installed everything to make sure that all the nodes are working, that your GPFS is working, your coupling facilities are good, you know, your replication set up properly, the status of the disk, all the sort of stuff that, that before you'd have to do manually. So that's now been built into PureScale and really, like I said, makes it easier to manage the whole PureScale uh, installation. Now, I mentioned also some virtualization environments. Something else that's been added in this release is, is important for customers who want to use, you know, virtualized pure scale across a cluster of machines, but also want to use the hardware, so these Rocky adapters, for high performance switching. Okay, so we've allowed you now to use these specialized adapters and virtualize them across a number of servers. So it's better to explain this with a, with a diagram. So let me just show this to you here. What this shows is four physical servers, all right? So I bought a bunch of these, um, you know, Intel-based servers. They may have, let's say, you know, four sockets, 16 cores. In fact, these days, you know, you can get um, chips that have 20 cores on them. It's like, wow, crazy amount of hardware. So the thing is that I don't need all that hardware for one of my virtual machines. I may only need a bit of it. So one way to kind of share the resources is to put you know, a bunch of LPARs, I call them LPARs, but you know, logic partitions. So I've got a host, you know, uh, split across a number of physical machines. So you can see the green, for instance, is a, a set of instances. You'll notice I've got four hosts across there. That includes some coupling facilities and some members. Another host is in yellow, another host is in blue. And in order to make efficient communications, I'm using something called a Rocky adapter. So this is what allows me to do memory to memory communications. And rather than having an adapter for every virtual machine, I just have one adapter on each physical piece of hardware and is virtualized and shared across all those machines. So what it does is it reduces your cost and complexity of coupling these things together using hardware. So this is a nice new uh, feature in PureScale in this release as well. Now, like I said, you don't need to have Rocky adapters. It just makes the communication more efficient, right? Because I'm now doing memory to memory communication rather than you know, through uh, sockets and stack communication. Now, another thing that you need to be aware of is that, you know, GPFS, which is the file system that's used by PureScale, um, you know, is, is fairly complex to set up, especially when you want to have something called a geographically dispersed PureScale cluster. Now, let me explain what GDPC is. GDPC says, I'm going to create a cluster and it's across two physical locations. Okay, so that says that, you know, perhaps I have part of my cluster on the west end of London and the other half of the cluster on the other side of London. So we can actually make it look like one individual cluster to my users, but they're physically separated by a certain distance. Normally we say the maximum distance is about 60 miles. Okay, that's, that's kind of the outer limits of the ability to scale this way. But what's nice about it is that if the cluster on the west end goes down, Nobody notices because the cluster is still running on the eastern part of London. So it's all, you know, connected. The database itself, the file systems are actually uh, split across the two locations. So if I lose all the disk on one side, it doesn't matter. It's still accessible on the other side. So this is kind of your ultimate continuous availability solution. But this is going to cost you a lot of money because, first of all, you need to use specialized hardware to get that communication across the two sites. Uh, we call it dark fiber, right? Um, you're going to have to replicate the disk on two sites. You know, you've got special switches across two sites. So it's, it's, it's very expensive to do this. 
But on the other hand, if you need this kind of critical high availability, plus, you know, continuous availability, you can do it now by splitting the cluster across two different locations. So that's called uh, GDPC. Um, and in fact, you'll see that uh, there's the example of the replica of the databases, you know, and it doesn't matter which side I connect to, I still access the data. Now to set that up, it used to be pretty complex. And you can see some examples of the commands, and you'll notice the what number point number two is actually the one that I see is, is the biggest change, is that to replicate, to turn a file system into a replicated file system used to take about 24 commands. And imagine the opportunity to get that wrong. You know, now it's just two commands in pure scale. So again, it's it's really simplified the whole deployment. I don't expect, by the way, many people to be using GDPC. That is a really specialized pure pure scale, um, you know, install, and that would probably require. And in fact, it's mandatory to use our lab services to help you get that up and running. So, George, a quick question for you now. <clears throat> you talked about uh, uh, all the different options uh, that you have for hardware and virtualization. Um, when would you recommend using, you know, hardware-based locking via RDMA or simpler sockets connection? Well, later on, I'll show you a uh, benchmark we did on on Power Little Endian, but it's probably exactly the same on Intel from a scalability point of view. But when you really need hardware locking, is if your workloads are approaching, you know, let's say 80% write. Okay, when you're getting into those very high write uh, workloads. Yeah. Hardware locking is going to be much more efficient than socket-based. But you know, for traditional workloads, you know, where you have the you know 80-20 rule, 80% 80 of it's read, 20% is update, or even you know, we've seen as as good as 50-50 that you get pretty good scaling with sockets, right? Up to about four nodes. So again, I'll, I'll show that in a in a benchmark a little bit later on. But um, you know, where I worry about workloads is when they're almost all write workloads, and that's what's going to be more expensive in a pure scale cluster. Okay. okay. So actually, it comes, actually, this slide is a good opportunity to talk about your options here, because HADR is also allowed in a pure scale environment. And we've changed the, the HADR configuration in pure scale in version 11 to allow both synchronous and near synchronous um, support for HADR. So that means that for most customers, they'll use near synchronous. Now, to just tell you the difference, the original version of pure scale only supported async. And async means that when the transaction is taking place on the cluster, <clears throat> as soon as I know that the transaction is complete, I'll send the record or the transaction log over to the second cluster. But I won't even wait for it to be acknowledged. I just put it on the queue and I say, out you go. And we send it on IP to the HADR server, wherever it is. We don't even know if it's actually received the message, whether it's applied it, whether it's done anything. So that's async. Basically, like, here you go, and I don't care about you anymore, right? Yeah. Whereas near sync says, okay, I've got the transaction here on my primary. I send the record over to the secondary. The secondary acknowledges that it's received it. And at that point in time, I commit the row. Okay, so I know that the secondary has already got it. Okay, and then, but I'm not waiting for the secondary to write it. So that's kind of near sync. Whereas sync means I wait until the secondary acknowledges that the, the record has been written to disk and then I you know, right to disk. So we've, we've synchronized. So it's almost like a two-phase commit, commit, right? So right. the thing is, what is the window of failure? And window of failure means that something goes wrong. Am I going to be in sync? Or is the second site going to have all the transactions? Am I going to lose any rows? And the odds of losing a row is next to zero with near sync. Because what happens is that near sync, if I've been told that near sync got the row, and I now fail before committing the row, what would have to happen is the secondary would also have to fail at the same time and not have written that row to disk. Okay, so that's a pretty rare thing to happen. Okay, so most customers, I say almost all of our customers that are running HDR will run in near sync because um, you know the extra overhead of waiting for the commit on the other side and the transaction to come back, you know, it elongates your entire transaction time and it's probably not worth it. Okay. Anyway, so HDR is now supported, right, and pure scale in both of these modes. Um, if you do decide to go on GDPC, we now support some very sophisticated switch configurations, and we can both use both Rocky adapters, uh, TCP IP, or InfiniBand. But again, this is a very expensive configuration. This is for the highest possible availability that you want. 
where these two sites are separated by some distance up to about 60 miles. Okay, and uh, like I said, it's a very complex setup, but it is certainly supported in a variety of configurations. And again, the, you know, Iqbal, we'd need your help in getting this set up, and also Lab Service would be involved just to make sure you've got the right, you know, yeah. switches and and microcode and all sorts of stuff. Okay, and as you can see, if you look at this topology thing, this is like redundancy of everything. You know, redundancy of adapters on the members and the coupling facilities and the switches and the, you know, it's just so many different ways of setting this up. But basically, you can have major switch failures, you can have site failures, you can have storage failures, and your system continues to run. So again, this is for those types of, you know, systems that just need the utmost in availability. And, and, and we can do that with PureScale today. Yeah. You know, my bottom line is how much do you want to pay? Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, how many nines do you want, right? Exactly, yeah. And and you know what's gonna cost you the money? It's not so much the actual CPUs, it's it's those switches and the cabling and the you know high what I call dark fiber between those different switches. Yeah. And by the way, we have customers doing this today. Okay. Okay. And that was, I was just I was just going to ask you, you know, has there been any how is the uptake on GDPC? Oh, absolutely. But you know, again, you see, it depends on what your, you like you said, what is your requirements for availability? And if it's, you know, if I don't need completely nine 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 to the nth degree, you may be able to do this with just HADR on a local, you know, uh, pure scale cluster. Yes. I, I think I think for most customers that would probably be a, a scenario, you know, to, to 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 give considerable thought to, isn't it? You know, local right. local pure scale cluster with HADR. To a remote, you know, cluster as well. Right. You know, like if it's a banking system, then I can see that. Um, yeah. We even have we have a tax authority in one country that runs on PureScale. But what they do is they use it for continuous availability locally, and then they have an HADR cluster, and they're willing to have a 30 second downtime. Right. That's okay. All right. Whereas PureScale says basically, I can. There's no downtime because any transaction that was not running on the member that died would continue to run, right? So you don't see an outage in most cases. Okay, so this is the key thing that people need to look at. This is the scaling of using hardware versus just sockets. Okay, so the one that says 3.5 times scaling, that's using RDMA, um, so that is memory-to-memory -memory communications, using, in this case, up to four members, and you can see the scaling is about three and a half times. And when we say scaling, it's not directing transactions to a particular node. This is random transactions going to any member, right? So I don't have to write my code to go to a particular machine. It's like any machine, run, okay? So this was an 80% read, 20% write workload. Then with four machines using just sockets, so not, not using memory to memory, just using sockets, you can see the scaling is pretty darn good. So for those customers who are only gonna run with two members, the interesting thing is that you get pretty good scaling with two members. And when, remember we showed that slide that says, let's use that two node option, where one is my workloads, and one is my kind of, for things like backups and statistics and whatever, so administration. You don't have to worry about scaling because all your workloads are gonna continue run on your one member, right? So it's not gonna get impacted by because you're running in a pure scale cluster. So, you know, uh, with two members running, you know, you should get, you know, great performance just like you did before. The only difference is you've got a second node available now for it to offloading some stuff from that primary, but also sit there in case there is a failure and it's like instantly hot to run your workloads. A um, couple other things we changed. You may have seen these in our earlier presentations that there were some things we did with our internal buffer pools and latching protocols where you know it results in much higher throughput in DB2, whether it's running on a single instance or in a pure scale cluster. And you can see that we get about a 60% uh, throughput improvement in uh, Enterprise Edition, and we see about two times improvement in pure scale. So some you know huge benefits from some of the things we've done internally, and there's nothing that customers have to do in order to implement this. This is just buried in the code. It's just some better um, latching logic within our systems. It's quite amazing, really. Yeah, it is, actually. It's, um, it really did. They really did redesign some of the way that we do some of our um, latching. So just as an example, we know that on a single core, we were able to do about 300,000 latches per second, 
Um, and now with the new algorithms, we can do about 60 million. So that's a huge uh, throughput improvement. And we're just handling how buffer pages are used and stuff within, within memory. So that's, that's been a big change. Um, the other thing we've done too in uh, this release with PureScale is that when uh, certain events happen, so basically when somebody is running a batch job, and batch jobs tend to do things like, you know, delete a whole bunch of rows because I'm inserting a bunch of new stuff or, you know, that type of work. It impacts your OLTP workload quite significantly because we're going through the buffer pools, cleaning out pages and getting rid of stuff. And you can see prior to version 11 that the throughput of your OLTP workload, which is the line in blue, was impacted quite dramatically by these drop, you know, things. Whereas now in, in version 11, you can see there's a lot less impact. There still is some, obviously, because we are going and, and rearranging pages and buffer pools and stuff, but it's it's been improved considerably. So again, you shouldn't see as much impact on your OLTP workloads when people are running batch jobs. So again, that's a big improvement in version 11. Absolutely. Another thing we've changed in, in PureScale is how we do workload balancing. So this is for customers who want to run across a larger cluster. So this isn't our two node cluster. This is probably like for three or four node clusters. And um, there are certain rules of how failovers happen and how workloads uh, were balanced across a cluster. So for instance, in a, uh, let's say in a four node cluster, you could say to, to PureScale, I want you to workload balance based on what's happening in a server. So what we would do is we would look at the least used server and your next uh, transaction would go to the server that's less used. So we call that workload balance, right? We're basically looking for the least used server. Or we could do something called affinity-based um, transactions. So affinity-based means here's a set of servers out of the group that you're allowed to go to. So if there's a four node cluster, you may say the first two nodes are the ones you're allowed to use. So accounts payable, you run on nodes number one and two, and accounts receivable, you run on three and four. And that's only places you could go. So you would go between one and two, and that's all you would do. And even if you were fully used up in terms of processor usage, even if three and four were empty, I would never go outside my set of workloads of members, okay? And the last one's round robin. So basically you start on one, you go to two, then three and four, and you go back to beginning. So there's, there's different strategies for how you run your workloads. Now those strategies also apply to what happens in a failure. Okay, so there was something called inclusive member subsets and exclusive member, member subsets. So that would happen is, let's say you've got your two members that you're running against and one of the member fails. Okay, so what we would do is we would look for another available member somewhere. So even though I was only allowed to use one and two for my workloads, I would say, oh, well, you know what? Three and four are available. I'm gonna use one of those for my workloads right now because one of my members failed. Okay, so that's called inclusive member subsets. Exclusive member subset says, I'm only running on one and two. If two fails, too bad. I can only use member number one, that's it. So I kind of lose half my capacity. So it depends on your environment. You may say, well, that's okay. If counts payable loses half their capacity, who cares? They just sit in that, that group. Now, that may be a strategy you use for things like reporting. Reporting is an example where reporting is important, but it's not mission critical. So if reporting loses one of their members, I don't care. You guys sit with what you got left. But for accounts payable, I may say, okay, I may only be using one and two. If two fails, then I want you to go use three or four or whatever is available because we've got to continue to give that service, you know, to the members. Um, so that's kind of the failover um, scenario, how it worked in version 10.5. Um, what happens now in, in 11 is we can add some more flexibility in how we do that um, balancing, okay? So we can actually say if there's a failure, here are the nodes that I want you to consider for failover based on a priority. So we could say, all right, if you fail, then find a node with priority one or priority two or priority three. So we kind of have a list of which ones we can fail over to. Okay, so it makes it a little more uh, flexible of how failover happens. We can also dynamically change which workloads or where you're running. So that's something that's also new because before it used to be part of a policy. That means that when you connected, there's a policy associated with your connection that says, here are the members you're allowed to work on. Now what we can do is we can actually dynamically change which members you're allowed to work on. So the better way to show this is through a couple of charts, okay? So a couple um, failover charts. So let me just skip to an actual picture here. So you can see here we've got batch that's dedicated to members zero and one. And we have OLTP that's dedicated to four and five. And you'll notice that in the chart, it says failover priority. So batch number two, batch would say number two member 
is the one that you should fail over in event of a failure. Okay, so in case, let's say, well, I, I, we've got it backwards here, but let's say OLTP, you'll notice that member number five died, and we said in our list that member number three is our failover member. So you'll notice it'll go over to three, and in the case, let me go, sorry. So in the case of batch, we say its failover member is number two. So you'll see that we can move our workloads to different members based on failover. What it also lets us do is say, let's say during the day, we find that OLTP doesn't have enough resources, and we're running, let's say, on members four and five, we can also dynamically say, ah, I want you to now include member three as part of your work group set. And that means that the administrator or this DBA can instantly have that workload now running across three members or four members. So it's kind of a way of, of adjusting which members run what workloads. And we can do that dynamically now, whereas before it used to be static. Um, so a lot more flexibility now in PureScale of how you fail over to other members but also I can dynamically change which members I'm going to run against. So, you know, a lot of flexibility there. That's, that's quite powerful, really. Yeah, it is. Um, and what's nice, like I said, is it's dynamic now. So I can dynamically change which uh, members that you're running against uh, during the day. That's, that's very nice. Yeah, so we've, we kind of showed you a lot of stuff here. So I kind of want to summarize, again, what's new for PureScale and things that you may want to use it for going forward with version 11. So remember, so PureScale is a shared database system. So we're, every member that's running is going to share the same database. So we share the database, but the logs are separate for each member. So the cluster can contain anywhere up to 120 of these members. For the new, what we call, um, you know, business continuity feature, you have two, right? One is your primary member for workloads. The second one is there just for administration and for failover. But you can expand upon that to have as many nodes as you want, but only in the advanced editions. So advanced workgroup and advanced server edition can have as many nodes as you want. You just pay for them, right? But for the other editions, so workgroup and enterprise, I can use two nodes, one for your primary workloads, one as a, you know, a failover node, but also for administration. So that's what's included now in all of the packaging, right? You do need to have some additional resources available for your coupling facility. So that's typically a core. You know, and the way we do it, if it's a Linux, we kind of we kind of set up side one core to do the coupling, right? To do the locking. So you'd have one core assigned on, on two machines. You don't need to license them, right? So you're not paying for that resource, right? Uh, they could be separate machines if you want. Again, you're not paying for it, but you know, for a simple solution, there's no need to create separate machines. And then the interconnect for your two node cluster, probably better off just using sockets. Um, if you do, you can use RDMA or InfiniBand, but that's extra cost, right? You've got to buy extra members. Um, so a lot of good stuff in this release, right? Simplified PureScale ins install, the ability to have a second node there kind of as a failover, HADR for, you know, having disaster recovery to a second site, if that's what you want to do. We didn't touch upon it, by the way. Like HADR also allows up to three standbys, right? We have a primary standby and then two other ones that could be in other locations. Um, we can also do things like um, time delay for HADR. So if you don't want that second site to be immediately updated, right? By the way, people ask me that, Iqbal. They say, why the heck do you want to have a time delay on a second <laughs> site, right? Like, you know, you think that I want it to be instantly available in case there's a failure. Yeah. Uh, and the reason we do that is for logical failures. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so logical failure, people are not aware of that. Logical failure would be like IBM giving a bonus to all of its employees. That's logically wrong, okay? <laughs> but, but, the, but the problem is that somebody said commit, right? And the database doesn't know that it's a bad transaction. All they know is that you said commit. So that logs record would get sent over to the second site, and we allow uh, what I call time delay. So if you can get to the second site and stop that from occurring, you can shut down the primary start up the secondary, roll forward to the point in time where that was that bad transaction and not yeah. apply it, okay? And so that's, that's uh, why you would use time delay, okay? But, uh, but I'm assuming in Triton that would be logical because you people probably make more money than I would anyway. But, uh, <laughs> so, so lots of great stuff in PureScale in this release. So yeah. something that people should look at if they haven't already. I mean, it's got to the point now, I think it's something that people should consider, at least from a, a continuous availability point of view. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. I just have a couple of questions before we kind of, you know, bring this to an end. Um, so we had uh, blue on a single node, right? We had blue with HADR. Now we have 
in version 11 we have blue with MPP uh, you know what my question is you know, where I'm leading to blue on pure scale is that on the horizon is there any plans can you share some information with us yeah that's a good question a lot of people have asked for blue on pure scale because they have uh, reporting systems analytical systems that they say need to be continuously available because they're just as important as my transactional systems so it's it's certainly in our um, pipeline of things to do. Can't commit to a date to you, but it's certainly something that uh, we are investigating because, like I said, it comes up as a very high requirement. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, the other thing is, you know, if, if I was, if, if you know, I had a customer who was coming from an Oracle uh, rack environment, uh, could 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 the could, could the customer use Oracle compatibility mode in pure scale? Um, yeah, yeah. There's no reason why they can't. So they can they can use their same um, functions, features, you know, PL SQL is supported, data types are supported. So yeah, they wouldn't see any difference other than it's probably easier to set up than a rack. Absolutely. Okay, good stuff. That's I think I think you know we already we on time. I think that was uh, all I had. So thank you very much, George again. And I'll pass it on to Julian. Okay, thanks very much guys. Uh, apologies that we ran just a couple minutes there, but there was a lot of information there for, for George and Iqbal to go through. Uh, so we'll wrap up on this session. One last session for next week. That's uh, Tuesday, the 21st of June. Again, 4 till uh, 5 British Summer Time, same uh, time as uh, as the, the last three sessions have been at. And next week's, uh, the last in the series, we'll have George and Iqbal in the same room in London, um, and they'll be uh, spending that hour talking about SQL for the converted and talking about the exciting new SQL syntax in DB211 that makes it easier to port from other databases. So from that, thanks for your attendance, and we hope to see you next week. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.